it's so weird. Um, so we're just at 702 and 106 people. Um, so I'm just going to uh, mute everybody. Um, and I'm going to find uh, Melissa and <laughs> make sure she's not muted. And Melissa. Oh, okay. So she can un unmute. Okay. Oops. There she goes. Okay. So Melissa and I are the only ones unmuted at the moment. Um, and Melissa has uh, got, uh, tested everything out. So the, the, just a couple of housekeeping things. Please stay muted. Um, and once we're going, if you use the stop video, since we're piling up into the plus 100, uh, the, the, sometimes the video um, overloads um, the bandwidth. So, um, and the other thing is we will use the chat for questions, but we'll review them at the end rather than during the, um, during the presentation. So uh, we're up to 114. I'm going to give it another four or five minutes, three okay. minutes, two minutes, because they're coming in pretty fast. So, yeah. um, and then we can let people join as they arrive. <laughs> I'm excited so many people wanted to come. Me too. <laughs> I don't think we've ever had one with this high a number. Of oh, residents. that's pressure. Yeah. <laughs> well, it means it's a good, it's a, it's a good topic. As, as someone pointed out already, it's the right time of year. For it is the right time of year. I saw grass today and I was very excited. Grass in the front yard. Yes, I have a bit of grass showing, but I also have a sidewalk. Uh, the main sidewalk has a lake. Oh, yes, yes. Can't get it to drain because the, um, the, uh, the the drain point is there's one drain point and the other one is buried in a windrow. Ooh. Yeah. So. Yeah. See, you know, that's the advantage of living on a busy bus route. Is our <laughs> they came and scooped away our windrows. I mean, it was it was still a nightmare to have done, but yeah, it's uh, our road is kept pretty pretty squeaky clean out there. Yeah, so we're up to 121, and it's 705. So um, I think we'll 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 get going. Sounds good. So uh, this is Brian Stevens from the ENC. Um, I don't have a great deal to say um, about Melissa. I think. Um, we, our club kind of discovered a lit, um, Melissa, or she discovered us because of all the wonderful birds she was finding in her yard. And that led us to the idea that, hmm, she must know something about building the right kind of yard. So I'm going to uh, pass it over to, to Melissa and she can carry on. Okay, well. Thank you everyone for coming. I'm super excited to do this. Um, I've done this the last couple of years for my community league and uh, last year was by Zoom, but the year before was in person and I get to do it again for them next week. So this is my larger attended warm up, I guess. So I think I maybe have that backwards. Um, I'm not gonna say much about me because it's totally irrelevant. So my name's Melissa. That's pretty much all you need to know for the information I'm gonna be putting forward. Um, what I'm gonna cover is uh, quite a few topics. So I'm gonna try and whip through things and I, and I know I already talk fast. It's gonna be breakneck speed, hold on to your hats, get a glass of water and here we go. <laughs> Okay, so you are here because um, apparently I inadvertently somewhat on purpose built an urban wildlife habitat. And uh, the reason I started sharing that idea is because when you think about it, we're losing habitat for birds and other animals at uh, an alarming rate. And we can put the effort into 
doing things like, um, you know, like signs like save our parks. And it's so important because these spaces are so much better than what our yard could be. We'll be realistic. But that doesn't mean that we can't contribute more um, by turning our own pieces of land, whether they're large or small, into these wildlife habitats. And so I started speaking to my community league because I thought, oh, wow, what if a few people in my community did this? What a huge impact that would be for birds. Um, and I'm going to guess I'm going to show you what I did. And uh, like, we're, like I said, we're going to do questions at the end. Okay, so now this program, of course, I use once a year. So I am going to just arrange my screen. If you see me looking in weird directions, it's because I'm looking at four different windows. So I apologize, I'm not making good eye contact with you. Um, before we go much further, in the chat box, I put a link to my Instagram because I put videos every day from my bird baths, from my nest boxes, uh, from feeders, wherever I end up putting up a camera, I put that on my Instagram. And I kind of post daily about the things that I'm doing in my own yard, whether that's adding a new plant or a new tree or taking out something or um, how I'm arranging my bird baths this year. So you'll want to, if you use Instagram, um, if you follow me, then you'll be able to get kind of information as it happens. The other link is for my YouTube channel. So some of the things I'm gonna mention in here, I've actually gone into way more depth about like winter sowing. What is that? That's planting perennial seeds outdoors in the winter in containers. There's no time for me to go through the whole process here, but I actually already have a video that I made last year on it. So if you go to my YouTube channel, then you can see um, some of the things that I'm going to mention. You can see them in much more depth. Okay, so why did I start doing this? Um, I have uh, I have a very soft spot for little yellow birds. And I used to drive around and try and find little yellow birds wherever I could once they migrated through. Actually, they didn't have to be yellow. Any tiny bird I was absolutely smitten with. And I love to take pictures of them. And so what I found is that I was spending a ton of time driving around and looking for birds and sometimes seeing nothing but magpies. Uh, and then I would come home and I'd be like, oh, there's a great bird in my yard. And finally, in 2019, I, I said, I'm going to make the birds come to me. Um, there's probably people in this, <laughs> in this Zoom call that know me personally. And when I say I'm going to do something, I absolutely am going to do it. And literally, if I die trying, I'm still going to do it. So I put everything I had into trying to figure out how I could make the birds come to me. So the first year I started counting, I'm not going to go through all the species, but they were fantastic. And I was so surprised that in 2019, I had 64 different species of birds come through my yard. And of course, because I love little yellow birds, I was even happier that many of those were warblers. And uh, I was ecstatic. And this, um, even though I wasn't doing, well, I mean, I'm still not doing everything right. But then I really wasn't doing things right. Um, but I had done enough right that it made that kind of difference. And then so I was really motivated and really excited for the next year. The next year I turned into 67 species and I thought, okay, so I'm doing better. But what was really interesting is that it wasn't all the same species as the year before, plus three. It was some didn't come back and then some new ones came. So I thought, well, what if the next year they all came? Well, that didn't exactly happen, but in 2021, I had, well, initially I had 71 species, and then I came across a folder of photos that apparently I'd never looked at, and there was a Philadelphia Vireo in it, and I, th I thought one hadn't come, so I was able to change my species count to 72. Now I'm really motivated, and things started coming that there's absolutely no way that should be arriving in my yard. And I was like, okay, I am going to make my yard so extra, like really like hashtag extra, that no bird is going to want to pause it by. I'm also quite competitive in anyone in this call. They, they know that, but speak nicely of it. Um, so then this year, it always starts out kind of slow, but I'm at 19 species already. And I'm looking at this list and I'm thinking, okay, I have a couple of species that I hadn't seen either yet 
or for years. So um, on this list, you might see I've, I've got Northern Ghost Hawk. I had one in 2016 um, that was an adult, but this year, uh, January 1st, uh, the first day I start counting for the year, um, a juvenile. So I was quite surprised. Um, and but you know, I had had that bird before. But then another bird on this list, I had a barred owl, which it like it blew my mind. When the owl turned around, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Um, so that was two things that I'd already um like hadn't had on the list since I'd been counting. So will that change my number for this year? I don't know. Is it about a number? No. Why am I telling you numbers then? Well, because you don't know me from Bob. And if I start saying things later on in this talk that you may have been um, told opposite information, you might think back to this and be like, OK, well, even if it sounds crazy, whatever she's doing is clearly working somewhat. And so hopefully then that will give you an open mind when I start telling you things that maybe go against the normal things that we have been taught about attracting birds to our yard. So when we bought this house, oh, I'm going to make my face disappear. When we bought this house uh, in 2011, this is what the backyard looked like. So we started out with some trees, obviously. Um, there's a Manchurian elm. There's a big apple. You can see some spruce trees. And right in front of us is a Manitoba maple. If he gives you an idea how much things change, the adorable boy on the right is in university and the adorable boy on the left is in high school. And in my other arm while I'm taking this picture is my darling daughter who is in, well, will be going into grade seven. So this was a while ago. Now, my sole focus at this point was to have an awesome yard for my kids to play in. At this point, I, I kind of knew birds existed, but you know, not really. But this is what it looked like last year. I didn't start gardening in 2011. I basically kind of just let it go and threw in a plant here and there, killed a few plants here and there. Um, but this is what it looked like last year. And this was about, I would say, three years of solid effort. Plants grow quickly. They really do, especially when you plant the right plants in the right spot. This is another angle of looking for the yard. So this is the opposite direction back in 2011. And this is what it looked like last year. So you can really change what your yard looks like. Um, and it doesn't cost a fortune. I do the things myself because um, I don't want to pay someone to do them. And I figure some of the stuff I'm doing, I, I can do. But there's absolutely times where I leave it to the professionals. I have my trees pruned professionally. Um, you know, you can kill your tree pruning in at the wrong time of year or ruin its fruit forever if you prune it incorrectly. So I absolutely leave that for the professionals. This was the very back of the yard going out into the alley. And this is what it looks like now. So I'm going to also show you the front yard. So front yard 2011 and the front yard now. But I use 2011 because I don't actually take pictures of my yard. It's just not something I really do. So even that I had any pictures, I'm kind of surprised. So I'm glad for this purpose, I had something that I could kind of show you a before and after. Um, so why did I do it this way? Well, it's because it's what birds are looking for. So they're looking for a wildlife habitat. So they're looking for, very simply put, food, shelter, and water. But those things, the food, shelter, and water, depending what your yard looks like to begin with, is going to be different. So I don't live near a body of water. I do not live near a forest. I do not live near a ravine. So I can still get these birds. So I'm confident that you can too. If you happen to live by a body of water or a ravine or a forest, it's going to be easier for you to get some of these species. And the same way, depending where you are, the species you get are going to be different than mine. If you live like um, near a storm pond, you might be able to get uh, tree swallows. I'll never be able to get tree swallows unless I have a giant pond one day and no backyard left. But um, my husband's in this call, so I'm not going to say too much about what my crazy future plans are. So what is a wildlife habitat? It's a place that provides food. This is the food we're talking about. Insects, seeds, berries and fruit, nectar, mice, 
other birds and bird feeders. So I have stars beside bird feeders because um, if you think about like a regular wildlife habitat, when you go out for a walk, bird feeders are not an important part of that. But I didn't want to not talk about bird feeders because most people who are looking to attract birds do have feeders. So I think it is an important part that, uh, that we can't miss over. So let's start on this list, insects. So in order to get the bigger attractions to your yard, like fancy birds and maybe some other mammals, I don't know, I'm kind of happy when anything new comes to my yard, you need to take care of the smallest visitors. And those smaller visitors are going to be the absolute backbone of your wildlife habitat. So I've got an Edmonton native plant here. Um, oh, so sorry, um, if there's people who are not in the Edmonton area, the plants that I put are native to Edmonton, but they also might be native to you. But you also might have some plants that aren't native to here. But the ones in this one are, but like I said, they might also be native to you. So just wanted to get that up. Okay. So this is false dragon head. And as you can see, there's a teeny tiny bug hiding out in here. And I don't really have a good look at it, but I think it's a masked bee. Um, when you take care of the pollinators in your yard, everything comes to, uh, everything comes together. You cannot have a yard without insects. So clearly you, that means you can't use pesticides and insecticides because everything you're working for, then you're gonna turn around and kill. So we want bugs in our yard. If we have beneficial insects that want those native plants, so we want to put native plants in, then they're also going to eat the pesty insects. The birds are going to eat both. So we start with the native plants to attract the native bugs. Native plants come in all different types. They come in all different um, soil needs, sun needs, moisture needs. So there's definitely something that's going to fit in your habitat. Uh, here we have giant hyssop, which is probably my favorite native plant. Um, it's gorgeous. I do have a bigger picture of it. And this is a red belted bumblebee. So when you have pollinators coming to your yard, that means that everything that you have that's growing berries or fruit is going to bear more berries and fruit. So that means you have more food to provide for birds. So it's all part of the same process and it starts with the native plants. Here's a shot of the giant hyssop. As you can see, I don't weed and there's little things growing everywhere. Some of the stuff came with the yard that I had just not been able to eradicate. And I've been digging it up for years like the Oh, what would it be? The lamium, I think, down there just does not seem to want to leave. I've dug this bed out too many times. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I wasn't going to, I'm trying not to look at the, at the chat, <laughs> but I did see a question come up that I, I was just actually about to say. Um, so where do you get native plants? Because I keep saying buy native plants. Well, it doesn't help if you don't know where to get them. So what you need to look for is somewhere in your area, for Edmonton, we have the Edmonton Native Plant Society who has plant sales throughout the year. They also sell some of their plants, well, at least last year they did, through Wild Birds Unlimited, who I know is carrying some of their native seeds. Um, so I've bought many plants from them. Um, and then also there is a grower and seller in Edmonton, uh, Nana from Arnica Wildflowers. That's Arnica, sorry if I'm talking too fast. Arnica Wildflowers, and she's fantastic. And she grows many native plants and sells them um, usually every week for uh, at the Collingwood Farmers Market. That's where I've picked up plants from her before. And also, um, sometimes what comes up is like seed swaps because you want to have different um, like genes of seeds growing in your yard. I am not a native plant expert. Um, I'm absolutely not. And so I rely on these people very heavily to help educate me. And they've been so kind and helpful the whole way. So I'm very appreciative that um, I've been able to have access to this. If you're down south, I've also bought from Wild About Flowers um, and they have a website and uh, it's they've given me great product as well and great service. So we're pretty well covered in Alberta. I don't know if other provinces are as lucky as we are to have these kinds of resources. Now, let me just say, 
uh, buying perennial plants from the regular nursery can be very expensive. Um, if you're looking for like a perennial plant in a, I don't know, like a seven to 10 inch pot, that might be about $20, $25. Um, native plants are half that price or less. And they take less resources to stay alive. They take a lot less water. They don't want fertilizer. They want your terrible soil that's Edmonton soil or wherever you are, they want your soil just how it is. So native plants are definitely for the win. Besides perennials, you can have things like native shrubs and trees. So here's a magnolia warbler in a Saskatoon berry bush. And now the magnolia warbler, even though it might eat some of the berries at some point, it's sitting in here because all of the native insects it's looking for are in this shrub. So uh, when we have our fancy migrants coming up that I know a lot of like, we look forward to it. They're so colorful. I mean, look at this bird. It's so exotic. It reminds us of like holidays in Mexico or something, but it's looking for bucks. So if you're putting a feeder out, hoping to attract a warbler, that's never going to happen. The bugs are what brings the warblers. Now, when the Saskatoon berry blooms fade and the fruit comes, that's when some of the bigger birds, like the vireos and the thrushes, like this robin, come to devour them. Now, there is nothing wrong with the color on this photo. This robin was devouring the Saskatoon berries before they were ripe. This bush was cleaned of berries before they had even ripened. That is what uh, such a hot commodity Saskatoon berries are in your yard. And there's several different, um, oh, there's more than several, there's many different native Saskatoons for Canada. So what you're looking for is the one that's native to Alberta. If I was a smarter person, better with native plants, I could tell you the Latin name, but I can't. So you might want to Google that on the internet. Another one of my favorite native plants that brings uh, some pollinators that we don't really think about is uh, moths. Moths are an extremely important food source for birds. And without um, access to a massive amount of caterpillars, birds are not going to want to nest in your yard. So you want to welcome those moth visitors just as you would a butterfly. I'm not going to lie, I don't like bugs, but I have accepted that I can't have what I want without them. And I have grown to love moths, even though I do, you know, when I put my moth light out, I wear full protective clothing and a rain jacket because I don't want them to touch me. But that's besides the point. Besides the point is we want moths, we want butterflies, we want all the pollinators. This is wild bergamot, which is another native plant. And uh, you might see it as a cultivar in the greenhouse as bee balm. This is the native version. Speaking of butterflies, uh, this is a Canadian swallowtail on tall lungwort. This is one of my favorite plants to put in a more shady area. I realize I'm spending too much time on each thing, so I'm going to start speeding up my slideshow. Sorry. Uh, Tennessee warbler eating raspberries. So besides the insects that these uh, native raspberries that I have in my yard are bringing, um, the fruit also gets eaten too. But you know what, for the raspberries, we get to them pretty quick first. But it takes time between the blooms to be ready in the season to the point where they have fruit that's ready and the fruit is going to be different at di uh, different times of years. Like the Saskatoons are going to be um, ripe well, if they last until they ripe before the raspberries are. So really early season, we've got pollinators um, relying on things like sap, like this Compton's tortoiseshell butterfly on a birch tree, it's drinking sap. And uh, this is an important thing to have in your yard. The sap from trees is not only used uh, and eaten by uh, pollinators, um, but it is said that the ruby throat hummingbird, the ruby throated hummingbird, follows the yellow bellied sap sucker who drills holes in trees to release the sap so that early season that the ruby throated hummingbirds can follow them and have something to drink. But when you have something like uh, Bertria, actually, I wish I had the video for this because um, on the day that I took this picture, oh, sorry, and all the pictures in here, they're all my pictures, um, just so you know. I haven't uh, just grabbed people's pictures from the internet and used them in here. They're all mine, so I'm allowed to use them. Um, this video was really interesting because there was a whole bunch of them on the Birch Street. Like, there, and I don't know how I lost the video, but that still kind of stings that I did. Okay, so now I have talked to Ten about native plants. 
And that is what I absolutely recommend. But I also have non-native plants in my yard. Most of those came with the yard that I'm not going to rip up at this point. They're established. I mean, my Manchurian elm is like 70 years old. I'm not getting rid of that. And, uh, you know, there's things like the, you know, I have a Mayday, um, which is nicknamed bird cherry. Um, there's crab apples that are loved by thrushes and larger birds coming through a migration. And those are not native to here, but they're still beneficial. And they're covered in blooms in the very early spring for pollinators. So there's different types of non-native plants and trees that are still beneficial. But what I'm learning along the way is um, that there's usually a native version. And so I'm still learning literally every day. Like I said, the bird cherry, the mayday. This is a Western tanager. This tree um, had, I think it was three or four Western tanagers every day for basically a month and they ate the entire tree. And then the vireo showed up and their noses were out of joint because they literally eaten every berry on my mayday. And then they moved to the apple tree, but they cleaned the mayday first. Something like hascap or honeyberries um, are used in different ways. They uh, flower extremely early in the year. Um, and then they fruit earlier than, I, I don't really even know anything that I have in my yard that fruits earlier than the honeyberries. But an interesting interaction that I've witnessed because I usually have uh, nesting red-breasted nuthatches is they strip the bark from the honeyberries and use it in their nests. Some of the other non-native things that we commonly grow in our yard are things like sunflowers. And the birds do love to eat from the sunflowers. A little patch of sunflowers is going to bring the American goldfinches. Uh, no fail. And uh, will one sunflower bring them? No, but there is a reason why goldfinch feeders are generally yellow. They love the color yellow. So if you have a little mass planting of sunflowers, you are going to see American goldfinches. But what I then learned is that there's perennial native sunflowers. So now I'm growing those instead. So that's the common tall sunflower. I believe there's one other kind, but I'm growing the common tall sunflower. And now here's the first reference I'm gonna make to my YouTube video, uh, YouTube channel that's, the link is in the chat. Um, I am winter sowing uh, common tall sunflower and low milkweed. And the whole instructions on how to plant your seeds in the winter, you probably for this year, you have probably about one more week to get that done before it's going to be too warm. So I would check that out later if you have energy left or if I completely tuckered you out, I apologize. Um, like I said, my Manchurian elm, this is where the red poles will go. They'll probably, they're probably in my American elm as well, except for that one is so much bigger and farther away from where I normally sit, I wouldn't be able to watch or take a picture. But uh, the common red poles, and, and I guess this is where uh, the finches, absolutely. Um, they're the most reliable seed eaters in your yard. So uh, if you want to see a show, put out the seeds um, for the finches, like the sunflowers, um, the, the meadow blazing star and the liatris, all these seeds that you leave on into the fall will absolutely get devoured by these migrating birds. And then when the red poles show up in the winter, there's definitely some left, but they're the most reliable uh, seed eaters in your yard. And like I said, here is the liatris. Um, the native version is called meadow blazing star. I've not been able to successfully grow that in my yard. And I'm thinking it's because I don't have enough sun. I have really big trees. So that means if it doesn't live in part shade, then <laughs> tough luck. Um, but I have tried a couple of try times. Um, like I said, I am competitive. That doesn't mean I'm gonna stop trying. Um, but in the meantime, I have grown uh, liatris bulbs and I put them in pots, but we're gonna, we're gonna get to my, well, my little potted plant problem. Uh, another thing that we think about for seeds and cones, it maybe doesn't come to mind right away, is the spruce. So uh, spruce trees are attractive in so many ways. And now, and this is the part where I show that I don't have the Edmonton native um, plant knowledge, is that I don't know if the spruce trees I have are native or not. So that's why I put it in this section, because I'm still learning. But the crossbills will come and they'll eat the seeds the nut hatches use the sap, the pitch, to line their hole. Oh, oh, there's a hungry cat that has arrived. Hopefully, my husband's listening, and we'll come and feed him. Uh, so there's, uh, like I said, the pitch 
the red-breasted nuthatches use it and they put it around the entrance hole of their nest cavity uh, to keep intruders out. So there's many uses and like you're going to see uh, like in the winter time, there's going to be birds seeking shelter in the dense branches. Uh, the spruces have so many uses and you know a lot of people avoid spruces because it's hard to grow right underneath them. Uh, not so much the acidity. Um, I mean that is a factor, but it's because they take so much water, but it's worth it. So um, find a place to put a conifer. Okay, so I did touch on this already. If you want to have a wildlife habitat, you cannot use pesticides and insecticides. Nobody wants a bright green lawn anymore. It's so passe and out of style. Trust me, it's a fashion faux pas in the wildlife habitat world. So let your grass go. It's not the end of the world to have a lawn. I still have a bit of a lawn, but I let the plantain grow in it, that little pesky weed, but uh, the moths love it. So I'm okay with that. And um, I would just say not to cut it too short, not to fertilize it and don't water it and you'll be fine. Uh, because things like northern flickers and robins are going to love poking around it, white-throated sparrows. They're going to be, they're going to love finding bugs in it. But when the grass is super short, no bugs can hide in it. So no birds can find things in it. So keep that in mind. Okay, I did have something on that last slide that I didn't say. Um, if you do have like, not like a pesky bug in your yard, but like if you have like a sick tree, get someone to come and look at it. Um, absolutely, a lot of these things are curable. And uh, the sad thing is it's way cheaper to cut down a tree than it is to fix a tree. But if you find a reputable tree company, I'm just gonna put them here. Cause like, you know, and by the way, everything I say and anything I've bought, no one gives me a discount. I don't get anything for free. I pay full price for everything. So if I say something's good, it's actually because it's good. And I, I never hold back when I think something's terrible. That does get me in trouble sometimes, but I'll do my best to stay out of trouble today. Okay, so there is, I've got um, just a little pop up there. Okay, so uh, Arbor Man Tree Care is who I get to come and do my trees and they have been fantastic. So that's not Arbor Care, that's Arbor Man Tree Care. Uh, it's a bird eat bird world. I'm sure some of you bird enthusiasts uh, have enjoyed seeing a Merlin tear apart a word. I mean, it's fascinating, right? It's kind of gross, but it's fascinating. Um, so we need to make sure that besides the bugs that, well, Merlins, they all see um, dragonflies, but you know, besides the bugs that we're also providing those bigger meals for those bigger birds. So here is a Merlin eating a house sparrow. And it's funny, it's always this branch in one of my front spruces, it's always this branch, it's like it wants to show off for the neighborhood, like look what I got. And the first indication that you've got a uh, Merlin eating a bird in your yard is that you'll look out the window and you'll see one feather. And then a couple of seconds later, you'll see a few more feathers. And then you need to go and look up and find out where those feathers are falling from. And that's exactly how I found this Merlin eating a house sparrow. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes, I'm going to give you a full view of this one second. Um, sometimes they take some of your bigger friends. Uh, so this barred owl, when it showed up, didn't leave until it took one of my northern flying squirrels. And it was a very exciting and fascinating thing to watch. Um, I just uh, wish that it maybe had been the more plentiful red squirrel opposed to one of my uh, probably slightly chubby uh, northern flying squirrels. So when you have a wildlife habitat, the hard part is, is that everyone should get a meal, whether you like it or not. And that's how you know that your wildlife habitat is thriving. Uh, this is Pee Wee. Um, Pee Wee has been with us. Well, actually, okay, Pee Wee was with us for about three months. I don't know if I still have peewee or not, because once the barred owl arrived, the peewee was not seen during the day again. But I still hear hoots during the day, uh, no mating toots yet. Uh, at night, I still see flybys from the flying squirrel camera or one of the other motion cameras. Um, and peewee is in my yard because I live in an older neighborhood and we have deer mice. 
And so I find pellets like this all over the place in my yard. And this one is a very good example of a whole lot of deer mouse fur uh, in that pellet. Um, so I've been working really hard the last couple of weeks to get a good night video of whatever owl is here. All I know is it's small. I don't know if it's peewee. I have nest boxes up and there's been no interest yet. I'm so confused. So it's mystery owl. When we're providing food for birds, not everyone has the same needs and uh, hummingbirds are going to be a different cup of tea. So this uh, Rufus hummingbird who shouldn't be in range for Edmonton stayed with us for three days and um, it was an amazing experience and we named him Rufy. Uh, he had a very big scar on his neck so I think if Rufy ever does come back, we're actually going to know it's him. Um, but when you are trying to attract hummingbirds, the most, uh, the, I guess the most frustrating thing is you start looking on the internet and everyone pretends it's easy to get hummingbirds in your yard. But of course, these articles are written where they have four or five species of hummingbirds that are occurring at the same time. Uh, and that's just not the reality for us. What we should be getting here in Edmonton is ruby-throated hummingbird. And this is almost the most northwestern tip of its range. And they're also solitary birds and extremely territorial. I'm just going to pick up this cat who decided he needed some love. Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought because of this large cat. Um, so when you're trying to get hummingbirds, all of these articles are written, grow this, grow that, plant this. Well, you know what? First of all, start with native plants. Uh, second of all, keep them up high. They prefer to feed there. But if you're like me and built an accidentally gigantic deck before you realized you wanted to garden for wildlife, the reality is you're looking for containers. So I was scouring the internet for the best hummingbird annuals that I could possibly put in. And over the years, I tried a couple of different things. And because uh, I, I was trying to attract hummingbirds before I was trying to build a wildlife habitat. And I didn't even put in pictures of how wrong I was. It's, it's a little bit embarrassing, actually. Um, but what I did here was a giant experiment. So I basically took every recommendation and put them out at the same time because there were so many contradictory articles. I was like, well, I'd like to know for real for here what's going to work. And so what? Oh goodness, I didn't expect that clip to come in here. I must have put it in the wrong spot. Uh, I'm going to play a little video for you. Um, so when we're talking about annuals for hummingbird, these are non-native plants. Um, and so what I did was look at these lists and they were all very pollinator friendly. But what your goal is, is to have the pollinators going to your native plants. But if you have nowhere you can grow them, uh, so in my case, the only place I have sun, there is a deck and a concrete pad. So I have containers. So I do experiment with different annuals that are excellent for pollinators and are reputed to be hummingbird magnets. Uh, so when you can attract uh, not only hummingbirds, but little things like this, let me just show you. I hope this plays for you okay, but all the videos are really short just in case anyone has an interrupted feed. So as you can see, there was a surprise visitor inside my Snapdragon who woke up on a Monday morning and decided he'd rather go back to bed. So there's so much you can observe and I'm so excited that we're getting close to that time that I can just watch all of these little miracles happening around me. I really, really can't wait. Oops, sorry, I'm having technical difficulties one moment. There we go. Okay, so for out of this experiment of all the things I grew, I mean, that Snapdragon that I just showed you, it was pretty fun and uh, the, bur uh, the bees, um, I don't know what, exactly what species that was of a uh, beneficial insect, um, but these are the ones that were the most attractive to hummingbirds. And that was both the Rufus hummingbird and the ruby-throated hummingbirds we had. So after years of trying uh, and putting out all those flowers, I had 35 days straight of uh, hummingbirds. And at one point we had four at the same time, what we call battle royale over top of these um, 
planted uh, annual containers trying to fight for the territory. So I finally felt like my work for years had really paid off last year. And these are what I would recommend. Scarlet runner bean, nasturtiums, tithonia, the red calabrasia, vermilion air, black and blue salvia, verbena, and nicotiana. So if you're looking to make a little hummingbird garden, that these are what I would recommend. Um, for an example, here is a ruby-throated hummingbird at the Scarlet Runner Bean. I grow them on obelisks. So this picture, the hummingbird is actually about 11, 12 feet high um, because these plants grown from seed, um, they grow really easily as long as you don't plant them when it's too cold, uh, grow so vigorously that um, they'll grow about 14 feet uh, in one season. So they're very exciting. This is the Tithonia I uh, mentioned, and it was a new plant for me last year, and I'm definitely growing it from seed again. Um, I don't, right over my shoulder, you can kind of see these containers. I winter sow half of it, and I'm going to grow some indoors just in case I do what I did last year and drop one of my bins of winter sown seedlings, which still survived, but you know, you, you can't really do that twice and expect it to work out, right? Now, hummingbird feeders. They didn't use mine, barely. This one used it a couple of times. I managed to get a picture. I actually had a motion camera on it. Um, but just a quick thing about hummingbird feeders. The internet says, you know, to clean them once a week. I say wrong. Um, I would put just a small amount of nectar in it and then empty it and clean it every like three, four days maximum. If you're looking for a hummingbird feeder, if it leaks, it's going to attract ants and bees and wasps, which will deter hummingbirds from going anywhere near it. They're very scary to them. Uh, if the little flowers on your hummingbird feeder are yellow, that's going to be more attractive to wasps and bees. So I would stick to um, these ones, which are little red flowers for the portals. Uh, buy a quality one because the leaking really, really attracts ants uh, and like I said, bees and wasps and you waste a ton of nectar. Um, the um, recipe is just one part table sugar and four parts water. I boil it because our water is really hard in Edmonton. And uh, I mean, anything for our pipes, uh, we can see the corrosion on that and the buildup. So you don't want that happening to your hummingbird feeder. So I do boil mine. I also find it's easier to mix. Um, and so I put out new hummingbird nectar, even though no one was using it, um, every three or four days starting May 1st. Um, my theory is the males come through earlier than people think. Uh, this year I'm considering starting at the end of April. Now we're rolling into bird feeders. Okay, I will uncover my face over that last picture in a moment. Um, like I said, we're going breakneck speed because there's just so much to go through. So I apologize and there will be questions at the end and all of this, everything I've said is absolutely on my Instagram. And we are recording this too, I just found out. So if there was a part that you weren't sure about and if you go on Instagram, if you send me a question, like, I'm so happy to answer it. I, I love um, finding out what other people are doing and uh, hopefully showing people what I've learned from my mistakes because it's not like I just walked out there and I was like, oh, I'm gonna do that right. No, I've done a lot of things wrong and uh, I want to hopefully skip that step for you. Uh, what are we looking at here? Bird feeders. So lots of us feed birds. There's only a couple of things that you have to really be aware of. The first is that the biggest benefit of feeding birds is not for the birds. The biggest benefit to feeding birds is actually for us. So you have to find that line between where the benefit for you outweighs the benefit for the bird. And that's where I, that's why I started with tray feeders first. So birds don't need us to feed them. They don't need us to give them extra vitamins or anything during breeding season or migration. They know what they're doing and we should trust that. And uh, do I think feeding birds is wrong? No, I just think we have to be very careful about it so that we're not having a negative impact when we're trying to do something good. So I don't use tray feeders. And I used to. Um, the only tray feeder I have is for the northern flying squirrels. And I have to go out and dump that in the morning so that the other birds don't hang out uh, and, and eat that. So uh, 
that's getting harder and harder. <laughs> so I'm giving the northern flying squirrels less and less and less. And so that they guarantee finish it because the birds are getting up a heck of a lot earlier than I like to these days now that it's brighter out. Thank you, daylight savings that I hate. Uh, back to tray feeders. They're a germy mess. There's no way to get around it. Birds pee and poo while they eat. The birds that love to use tray feeders are the ones that like to camp out with their food. And that means that even if you cleaned your tray feeder every day, it still wouldn't be fast enough to keep up with what's going on. And if there's any disease present, how quickly that would pass. The other example is like a fly through. It's still a tray feeder because they can still sit in it, poo in it, and then someone else goes and eats it. I know it's disgusting, right? Sorry, but it's true. So I'm gonna uncover my face because a lot of people use tray feeders uh, because they think that, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uncover this picture yet. Give me one more sec. Uh, use tray feeders because they want to attract more species to their yard. So they get a tray feeder and then they use like a multi-species bird mix. That's not actually the goal because um, there's a lot of birds then that are interacting with each other and feeding from the same place that in nature would never be near each other sharing a uh, you know, sharing a burger, right? Um, so that's why tray feeders are the biggest no-no, really. I'm sorry. Also, never ever feel badly if I tell you something that you're doing that I think is wrong because I used to do it. So I'm just saying that what I've learned because that's all we can do is take new information that we learn and go forward with it. Uh, also, some people use tray feeders to accommodate bigger birds. And this is where I'm going to get rid of my face. Okay, so instead for things like northern flickers, I use the big suet logs and they love them. They absolutely love them. I prefer to put out suet. I'm going to get more to what um, I do. Um, so I'm getting my, uh, we're going to get to my downy woodpecker, but I'm getting so many notifications from her box that it's distracting me. So I'm just going to turn it off. There we go. Okay. So I use these big seed logs for, um, I don't get a lot of pileated wood woodpeckers. I'm hoping to, but that hasn't really happened for me yet. So they come occasionally, but last year I didn't have one. Um, but for the Northern Flickers, they do love this. And now I would say that this is where uh, species specific really comes into play because when you're species specific, um, you're going to do better for birds. So tray feeders, I give that a flat no. Suet logs, I give a big thumbs up. Okay, so now we have a different kind of feeder because um, chickadees, like they'll eat suet, but they don't love it as much as seeds. And their favorite, and every time I see something, it's because this is what I've seen. Their favorite is the black oil sunflower. So if you look at this little picture here, um, this is the advertisement. And so you see this black cap chickadee and the seed ball is like absolutely full to the brim of seed. This is going to allow house sparrows to easily eat from this because they won't have to turn upside down. The next picture here is a picture from my yard because I have that seed ball and I only put about a third of a cup of seeds. And now this benefits uh, us and the birds because if you only put a bit in, then the clingers, so like the black capped chickadees, the red breasted nuthatch, the white breasted nuthatch, the downy woodpecker, and all of those I have seen on the seed ball are going to have to cling mostly upside down to eat. The house sparrows, they might do it once, but it's so difficult for them. They're going to look for an easier meal. The house finches are not even going to attempt this. The pine siskins might, but you know, the pine siskins and the red poles with those tiny beaks, um, the black oil is not the, their favorite. So this is going to be a very species specific feeder. Um, when I say species specific, I'm going to call it the clingers, okay? Because a lot of this overlaps. So if you look down, this is another type of similar feeder that's a tube, but I didn't pull the advertisement for this because I couldn't really find one. Um, but again, like the idea is that you need to fill your feeders. So when you fill your feeders up 
and they get rained on or snowed on and they sit outside for a bit, they're just building up bacteria and going moldy. So you want to put out as little food as possible and store your food well, and then it's going to be more economical for you to put food out for birds and the food that you're putting out is going to be fresher and healthier for them. But now you can see on this one, there's a red breasted nuthatch and a black capped chickadee sharing this. And this is just, um, just some pecan bits, um, like just from the baking section at the grocery store. So I would get those occasionally and just put like a little handful in the bottom and they enjoyed that very much. Let's get to the next one. Um, so when we talk about suet feeders, those are gonna be most attractive to the woodpeckers and the nut hatches, the white breasted and the red breasted. So I also have some of these smaller logs uh, for them. But what was happening is that the house sparrows, and this is a reason they're successful, they were so persistent that they were learning to get more food than I wanted them to and being a little too fixated on there. And I really didn't want that. So what I did is I hung it sideways and now the downy woodpecker, the northern flicker, this is a picture of a bigger log, the northern flicker and the white breasted and the red breasted nuthatch had no problem clinging upside down and eating from that suet log. And, uh, and then I just didn't put any suet up here on the top in those ports. So let's go back to this and click on other types of feeders. See, like I knew it's like feeders, it's so important, right? And I hope that like some of you are having like little like eureka moments when you're seeing some of this because um, we don't wanna give all of our food to invasive species. Okay, so we're talking about pooping in the food. When you have a cylinder like this and it has this catch tray underneath, even if it has holes in it to drain water, it still catches seed. So we've got, I don't know, let's call him Buddy Jimbo up here who's eating away, pooping away. And these guys on the bottom, they have to eat it. That's so terrible. Also, this feeder is filled to the brim. So it, advertising is really hard that way because it teaches us bad habits, right? But I'm a photographer. I didn't mention that before. I shoot people for money and animals for fun. And uh, the product photography, like it wouldn't look good if someone just put like a quarter cup of food in it and took a picture for advertising. So, but that doesn't benefit us as a consumer. So this other one is a better feeder because it doesn't have anything on the bottom to catch that food. So, but it is also filled all, to, all the way to the top. So that's my problem with it. Next one, squirrel proof. Uh, yeah, I mean, it works. Um, I actually had this exact feeder and I threw it away because the number one rule is for anything that you bring in your yard, if you can't clean it, don't buy it. Because uh, this one, like all the food was trapped inside. Every time I would like clean it, I would have to literally take the whole thing apart. And you know what? I don't have time for that. So uh, I don't really recommend those. Instead, if you're trying to squirrel proof, you should use a baffle on the top. Um, if you have it somewhere up high that they're climbing like down from a tree or a pergola or something like that, if you have one of these baffles over top, they won't be able to access the food. The added benefit is that this is going to keep your food drier and protected from the weather so that it's not going to get wool, uh, wet and moldy so quickly. Um, another trick is you can also attach one of these to the bottom if you have squirrels that are jumping from the ground. So you can use one on the top and the bottom but you also can have poles that have the, you know, the baffle thing on, um, on underneath. But I like to move my feeders around quite a bit because obviously if you're not having anything catching the food, it's going to fall on the ground and it's just going to get gross and moldy down there mixing with the poo. So you have to clean the ground under your feeders. So to help uh, be as disease free um, as you possibly can in nature, I move my feeders around so that it's not an extended period of time in one place. And so uh, then I have time to like rake up, clean up that kind of stuff. Okay, we're almost done the feeders. We're almost moving on. Uh, okay, quickly gazebo feeders. Like I said, this wooden one, you can't clean that. If you can't clean it, don't buy it. But it's not even clean it. If you can't bleach it is what you have to do, don't buy it. The next gazebo, well, that's closer, but it has the tray, which literally turns it into a tray feeder. If you're gonna have a gazebo, it's gotta have these little like open parts at the bottom. So any of the poo and food is gonna fall directly to the ground, but then it's your responsibility to clean the ground. Um, the only thing is, is if you're putting out this gazebo, who are you feeding? 
because this is a very good question. Because um, the other native birds are year round birds. We're already happy eating those other ways that I showed you. So keep that question in mind. Who are you feeding? If you're just saying birds, that means you're feeding house sparrows and house finches. And I'm going to tell you why you don't want to do that. Okay, so let's talk about first what you should be putting in there. Um, don't put multi species mix. You don't want them to actually be hanging out together. You've got to keep it fresh. I would buy smaller bags of specific food and keep it in the freezer. Not everyone has a deep freeze, um, but if you're only putting in a bit at a, at a time, uh, like what's realistically going to get eaten uh, before you need to clean it, you're not going to go through as much food. A lot of the mixes as well have a lot of stuff that's just filler that birds don't want and they throw it to the ground, or you're going to have a species arriving at it that just doesn't want that food that the other bird wants and it's going to throw it to the ground anyway. So it, it does get messy. So avoid the mixes, stick with the specifics, and know what your target species are. Okay, what's not supposed to be on the menu? Okay, mycoplasmosis. Most of you have probably heard of this as house finch eye disease. Okay, this is pretty fascinating stuff. Uh, this is present in all the birds they tested, but the other birds didn't get sick. It was the house finches. So when you're feeding the house finches and um, <laughs> they're using something like that has ports or a tray feeder. They really like to camp out and eat together. And the house finch eye disease is transmitted. They actually like have to kind of touch or in a very short period of time, touch that surface. So if there's like a little port on a feeder and they were putting their face in to access the food and they were touching the sides of their beak and eyes in that spot, it's gonna spread really quickly. And same within uh, a feeder because you might not see it, but they're gonna be vomiting a little bit too. Um, I know it's all, it's really quite gross. Yeah, wear gloves when you clean things. That's, that's my number one tip because birds are dirty. Uh, so, but the interesting thing is for this is that the mycoplasmosis doesn't um, stay on a surface. It can't survive on just a surface for a very long time. So if you're in some sort of like a regimen of like, well, I take my feeders down and I bleach them every two weeks. For house finch eye disease, that means nothing because in they're passing it to each other simply by using the feeder how it's meant to be used. So this is why I chose about a year ago not to feed house finches because then they take that house finch eye disease and they pass that on to other members of the finch family. And in my own yard where I've seen it before, um, pine siskins. And, but also susceptible in the finch family is going to be things like common red pole, um, American goldfinch, because sometimes they overwinter. Um, then there's going to be like the bigger finches, um, like the pine grows beak and the evening grows beak. And we don't want these guys passing them on. House finches are not native to here. They're not invasive, but they've expanded their range. Um, they're actually a released bird and then they made it illegal. Um, so then the people were like, oh, we got to get rid of the evidence. And they let them all go and they thrived in the wild and then they spread really far. So, oh, and I was completely remiss. I didn't say purple finch. Purple finch is the native one. And sometimes they're hard to tell apart. That takes a bit of practice. But my point is, who are you feeding? Uh, because if you want to keep that disease away, you should be focusing on other birds for your feeding enjoyment. The other one is uh, most common in a yard would be salmonella. So salmonella is the opposite. It's going to exist on a surface longer. So that's where the regiment of bleaching comes through. Um, birds are going to pass this on to each other quite quickly and they perish from it very quickly. So you want to avoid salmonella by anything you're putting it out, uh, putting out, keeping it very clean. Sorry, just shut that off. Um, keeping it very clean. So there was supposed to be a slide about bleaching. <laughs> so apparently that's coming up. Now, instead we'll move along. We'll talk about how I actually bleach things. When we get to it, I just use what the Cornell lab recommends, which is one part bleach, nine parts water. Okay, so shelter. Shelter is your garden. It's trees, shrubs, brush piles. It doesn't have to be alive to be good shelter. That is it, including snags, like cavities and snags, um, nest boxes and roosting boxes. These are all things that provide shelter. But 
just because it's not native and it wasn't on the list of the things that I said I loved in the yard, don't go ripping it up. Like I didn't have things like um, traditional roses, but they offer such good protection because of the thorns from predators for birds. So there are things out there. So first, before you do anything, before you dig things up, take a good look at your yard. Where have you seen birds before? Where have you noticed that they like to hang out, especially in the winter time? Where have they been seeking shelter? My best advice is to not do too much at once because you're going to learn so much along the way that you don't want to tear something up, put something in its spot, and then dig it up the next year. Not naming names, that's me. And like I said, I'm trying to save you some steps and some trouble and probably some money. So first, look at what you have. Make a good assessment. Okay, let's look back again. So uh, I left a lot of things that they had, but this whole fence line was bare. But the fence itself could be considered a uh, shelter, right? Um, I'm sure we've seen things that like have gone closer to the fence to get some windbreak. So by planting things along the fence, you're creating like a double wall. So you've got a plant on one side and a fence on the other. And that's where I realized what was really missing in my yard was a middle layer, the shrubs. So I spent a lot of time focusing on perennials, but what I was missing, I was like going perennials and trees. So you need to have like the shrubs inside because a lot of birds nest in shrubs too but they love to hang out in them more than anything and they like to travel they birds like to boop is what i call it they boop along and the continuous boop will make them stay longer in your yard so that's why i first improved this fence line now in the front this is a new thing for me i wanted the birds where i could see them all the time so i put all the good stuff in the backyard. But then last year I realized that I had a lot of space in the front yard that was not being maximized. Um, so I started tearing up some uh, garden duds, as I called them. They were not attracting beneficial insects. They were not flowering. Um, they were not fruiting or providing something like seeds or berries for the birds to eat after. And if it didn't meet those things, I was like, well, you're, you're out of here. Um, you know, like hostas for shade, like that's kind of people's go-to for shade and it does produce a pretty flower. But in my opinion, there's native plants like tall lungwort and nodding onion that are for shade that are native that attract beneficial insects that actually flower a lot more than just that one spike that comes, you know, out of the hosta. So there's a lot of options. And that's why I say not everything at once, because you're going to discover plants that's going to become your favorite. And you're going to want to have room to put as much as possible. Because the key with pollinators is they like planting. They don't like a sample garden, which is like one plant over here. And then over here, there's another plant. They like groupings and they like mass plantings. And that's where, again, winter sowing on the YouTube channel by getting a packet of seeds, um, like, well, I, I really like lupins and I'd never really had them. And so last year I winter sowed lupins and I ended up with over 50 plants that I was able to plant from one packet of seeds. And uh, now like even they weren't supposed to, but some of them flowered last year after being winter sown. Uh, and then this year I'm gonna have a huge patch of lupins and I'm so excited. Well, okay, I say that, but you know, there's always a chance that things could just die over the winter. We all know that now that we have things called polar vortex, but uh, you know, they're hardy. So I'm hoping, but winter sowing, you can do that. You can take a package of seeds and end up with a mass planting for a few dollars. So definitely check out that YouTube video. Uh, so in the front, I decided that I wanted to expand it. And this is also where I put my uh, sign that said I'm a certified wildlife habitat from the Canadian Wildlife Foundation. Um, I think it's an important sign to have, like, so you meet the criteria, you apply, and if they approve you, you can buy the sign. That's how it works. That sign is really interesting. I watch people walk by all the time and they notice the sign. Sometimes they go by the window and if I'm standing in it, they're like, yeah, and I'm like, yeah, that's pretty cool. But then it gets people curious. They're like, well, what is that? And then they see it and they're like, oh, well, I want to do that. And so you're kind of like, without saying a word, having people look at your space and see that sign and be like, I want this too. So I would definitely check out the Canadian Wildlife Federation program for that so that you can also have a fancy sign on your yard. 
And so what I did is I decided in the front, it was also gonna be wildlife habitat. And I planted a ton of flowering berry producing shrubs. So uh, this year should be a very exciting year. Hopefully again, if everything lived, uh, but don't forget to look at what your yard looks like from the top. Mine is the red house here. As you can see, I'm hoarding trees and you can't really see a lot from the sky, but to a bird going over, they're like, oh, look, it's a forest. That's great. So then they want to investigate. But since hummingbirds fly quite low and same with the pollinators, uh, I put everything visible from the sky because that's my best sun and pollinators love sun, just like the flowers they're looking for. So if you have a bird bath, you're going to also want to have, I like, I'm all about multiple bird baths. You're going to have one that's visible from the sky. Okay, sorry, where's my clicker? There you go. Uh, okay, so then we have spots we can't plant like this one. This one was concrete and some raspberry bushes uh, two years later. So this is the closest one that I have. Two years later, uh, it's a huge difference. Uh, what you can do, um, I built this kind of fake structure um, and uh, I wanted to create more density because that's what birds like, density. They like to hide. They like to feel sheltered and safe. And if you can make them feel that, they will hang around in your yard. So it's not only density going up and down or across, it's also climbing. So vines are a really interesting way to do this. I just planted some native vines in my yard, the uh, twinning honeysuckle and the blue clematis, and they're very small still. But this Virginia creeper, I'm hoping will get dense enough that um, some of the nest building birds might want to make a home in it sometime. So that takes a bit of time to get enough of a tangly mess for them to feel safe to do that. But it takes longer if you don't start. So I'm hoping this year will look good. Oh, and look, some of my lupins are down there in the bottom. Okay, if you like, I'm gonna get rid of my face so that you can take a screenshot. These are my favorite things. So if you're gonna get a tree, paper birch, American elm, burr oak, I have star beside crab apples because you have to be careful with crab apples because um, not all of them bear fruit. Some of them are just flowers. So if you're looking uh, for a crab apple that also bears fruit, you just want to keep that in mind. And then same with uh, just regular apples. I'm talking about like classic regular apple tree, not the like orchard along your fence, um, you know, like skinny shape to maximize fruit production but without much tree. I'm talking about proper apple tree. Um, mountain ash, there's many different types. Um, the mountain ash tree that's kind of most popular around here is the American mountain ash, like the big ones that we see. But the native one is the Western mountain ash, but that's more of a shrub. So that's why it's like, it, you have to know kind of what size you're hoping for. Uh, for shrubs, red is your dogwood, Western choke cherry again, that's like our native version of the Mayday, but it doesn't get as big. So that's why it's in the shrub section. It's all large shrub. Uh, Saskatoon berry, snowberry, honey berries, and raspberries. For perennials, I, I started to make a list and I just tried, I gave up. But uh, so there's a uh, giant hyssop, tall lungwort, wild bergamot, nodding onion, smooth blue beard tongue, Richardson's Ugh. Richardson's Allen Root, Metal Blazing Star, Liatris, because like I said, I hadn't had luck with the Metal Blazing Star yet, but I am growing the Liatris, Virginia Creeper. Um, I have stars beside that because where you plant Virginia Creeper is where it will be forever. I'm just going to show my face very ominous forever. Like this is like a lifelong commitment. Okay. Okay, uh, swamp milkweed is one of my favorite perennials, but it's not native to here, it's native to out east, but it is a pollinator magnet, so I highly recommend that one too. For annuals, sunflowers, and scarlet runner bean. Okay, it doesn't need to live to be good. A brush pile. So when you're trimming your raspberries, when our crazy Alberta, where do these winds come from, are knocking branches off our trees, as long as they're not diseased, they should be going in this brush pile. My brush pile is doing double duty. So I have this brush pile along the fence because you don't wanna put this near your house because mice also like it. You don't wanna put it beside your neighbor's house even if you don't like them 
because mice also like it. But this is a great place for uh, moths and butterflies to overwinter, other kinds of bugs to overwinter, and bugs to just go and hang out. And the birds also can hide in it to be safe from predators. Um, the big thing about my brush pile is that it's mostly raspberry canes, which are quite pokey. So this deters cats from approaching my ground level bird baths because I have them all around it, except for the very front where there's no sneaking possible. So there's another thing called a habitat pile. Um, that's gonna be one of my first projects this spring. It's like uh, the idea of a brush pile, but it's like a miniature log pile and you kind of stuff it with leaves and stuff like that. And you kind of dig it under into the ground a bit. So I'm still kind of researching how I'm gonna do that, but that's something I'm looking forward to. Uh, I definitely recommend a brush pile, the, especially for the skulky warblers and sparrows. They hang out in here, like, and that's right by the bird bath. So they go have a drink, go back to the brush pile. They go have a bath they go back to the brush pile. Um, so I highly recommend having one to uh, attract the birds that generally don't like to be seen. And then of course your leaf litter. So I have so many trees that I can't possibly keep it all. So I clear away the paths that we walk throughout the winter and early spring and late fall. And that still leaves quite a bit of leaves. And then we push those to the side so that there's a chance for the overwintering uh, bugs and butterflies and moths to have a safe spot to spend the winter and emerge in early spring. Now, in the early spring, um, those moths and butterflies and bugs might not really get a chance to emerge because there's gonna be white-throated sparrows and robins poking around in the leaf litter looking for bugs. The only thing I would say about leaf litter is that some uh, tree diseases like my birch miner overwinter in the leaves. So I clean up all my birch leaves to try and break that cycle. And it really worked last year. And even though they recommended cutting that tree down about 10 years ago, it's looking great. So uh, I'm going to keep doing that. Uh, predictably, it was also the last tree to lose its leaves in the entire neighborhood. So we had to wait a while. I'm going to play you a quick video to show you what white throated sparrows do. This is under one of my spruce trees, but to show you how they scratch up bugs. So you can see they're like little tiny happy chickens. White-throated sparrows should be arriving in my yard any day. I've had them over winter before, but not this year. So every day I'm kind of like hoping that it's going to be the day that they show up. Their early spring song is the most amazing uh, sign of spring that I can think of. Okay, so let me just squish on over to here. Oh, that's the same one. Okay, so... Um, Birds, nest places. I already talked about the vines, shrubs, nests in trees, cavities and snags. Snags are like dead wood and uh, in your nest boxes. Um, so if you have a bird nesting in your tree, like this robin here, you can see this nest down here in the corner. I can't remember if this was Wanda or Vision. Blue jays are so hard to tell apart uh, from male and female. Um, bringing one last finer thread to help tie it all together. Now, unfortunately, um, we have quite a magpie problem in our neighborhood and uh, neither the robins in the yard next door or Wanda and Vision's two attempts at nesting were successful. Um, so that was pretty heartbreaking to watch. The denser your trees, the better chance they have. Um, we just have so many magpies, they, they didn't really have a shot. They, they are in that tree again this year. They must know what they're doing. So I hope they have better luck. Uh, Blue Jays are normally known as the bullies. And I was really apprehensive when they started nesting last year. And I thought it was going to scare away a lot of birds. But as soon as they started nesting, they turned into these adorable, affectionate, quiet little tweetering birds. And uh, we got so much joy out of watching them. And um, I'm glad to see them back. But it does make me a little nervous because it was really difficult to see um, them have unsuccessful nesting because they worked so hard. Um, but what most of us are seeing that we have like actual control over in our yard is nest boxes and roosting boxes. So 
just like the feeders and the food. Nest boxes, even more so, have to be species specific. They should only be for native birds. So if you're squeamish or uncomfortable with the idea of evicting a non-native species from a box, it's probably better not to put up a box. So just keep that in mind because you really, really have to. Um, cavities in the city are at a premium. Of course, like when we're walking in a path within the city, they have to take down that dead wood because there's a chance it could break and fall across the path and injure someone. So it's understandable that we're trying to coexist with nature, um, but what that does is put a lot of pressure on nesting birds who need cavities. And so I have a little list here of the most common um, nesting birds we're going to see in the city uh, that use cavities. And so that's black capped chickadee, red breasted nuthatch, house wren, white breasted nuthatch is, is rare, but they would use a, a nest box. These are, sorry, the ones that would use a nest box, not just cavity nesting. Um, Northern flicker, sawwood owl, mountain bluebird, and tree swallow. So I'm never going to have mountain bluebird or tree swallow. Those ones are tricky because they need a one and a half inch entrance hole, which is also the preferred size of the house sparrow. So uh, mountain bluebird and tree swallow, uh, sometimes it's better to let them stay more rural, uh, even like if you're on the outskirts, um, so that they aren't faced with that competition. There's a lot of great bluebird societies and they have a lot of tips and tricks for um, making the nesting more successful for mountain bluebirds and tree swallows. So definitely um, a really good one is a uh, Cialis dot, I think it's dot org, S I A L I S, and I believe it's dot org. I don't think it's dot com, um, but they have excellent information, and that is one of the bluebird societies. I like, and like I said, I don't have them. I've just had actually other really useful information from their site. So when you're putting up these boxes, these different birds are clearly different sizes. So that's where the specifics come in. So when you're putting up a box, um, it needs to be made of wood. It needs to have safe for bird paint on it and only on the exterior. It needs to have a door that can open for cleaning. It needs to have ventilation. It needs to have a hole that is the right size for the bird for the box. And you need to be able to attach it to a solid surface we're not hanging boxes, not with the winds we have. There's just, and also it makes it really easy for squirrels to crawl down and get to the boxes. So we need to think also about predators. So I also have a picture here of um, a predator nest guard. So this would be, so this is kind of the tricky part. So like if you have a box right now and it's um, way too big, then, <sighs> you know, you could put a protector on it to shrink the size of the hole, but then the dimensions of the box are not the preferred for the species. They still might use it, but if it's just so big for a chickadee or a nuthatch, they're not going to be very interested in that box. They need quite a bit of a smaller box. And the Cornell Lab of Orthonology, nestwatch.org, has all the building plans on it for all these different species. So you can even just use those to check before you buy. Uh, personally, I don't really think it makes a difference if it has a flat roof or a peaked roof. Um, I've noticed no difference. All of my roofs are flat so that I can put a motion sensor camera on them. Um, but what you can use the predator guard for is if you have a box hole, you can preserve the size so that something like a squirrel doesn't start chewing at the box to enlarge the hole to get in. And uh, woodpeckers just like to do that for fun, which is very quirky of them. But this can at least, uh, these little guards you can buy at bird stores or online to uh, preserve Preserve the size. So at bird stores, this is where you're going to find mostly the best boxes for birds, right? But there's a ton of companies that specifically just make boxes for birds. So this picture up here, and again, like I said, I don't get discounts anywhere, but I've actually bought bird boxes from Prairie Nest Boxes, and they're phenomenal. They're well built, um, they're gorgeous and uh, they're a pleasure to deal with. So I adore them. Um, but uh, I would say you need to make sure to know what you're looking for before you buy. Do not go to Canadian Tire and buy a bluebird box and stick it up in the middle of the city. Well, we don't have mountain bluebirds in the middle of the city and all you're gonna get is house sparrows. Uh, decorative boxes, winners, home sense, what are you doing? 
we don't need this junky junk for our birds. We need to be vocal consumers. Um, if we let them know by buying them, it's okay. They're just going to make more and bring more in with cute little things saying on it. That's not what the birds want. This is again, one of those things where it's like, oh, that's so cute. The birds don't think it's cute. They're just looking for something that's going to mimic the proportions of a cavity that they would have used. So um, clearly made of metal. If this is actually a bird oven, and this one, this one looks like Hansel and Gretel are going to get eaten by the bird that lives here. It's a little intimidating. But if you really want to have a fun birdhouse put up as decoration, block the hole. But if you have all these birdhouses up that are decorative, the other birds might be too uh, afraid of competition and lack of resources to use the good one that you have up. So keep that in mind. So how do I do my nest boxes? Okay, well, here's an example. Here's a nest box on, uh, you know, the desk, the deck post spikes, so that instead of putting like a concrete um, into the ground for a deck, if it's a ground level deck, you can use these spikes from Home Depot. So we put one of those in the ground, and this is a four by four uh, cedar post um, that's put in it. And then this little box on top is for either was going to be for either red breasted nut hatches or black capped chickadees. And this box was actually claimed by red breasted nut hatches on February 14th. That's not spring, is it? Things happen much earlier than we think. And like I said, hot commodity in the city to get a good cavity. Now, my camera did not work when it was during the polar vortex, but that's the only time this was used for roosting. Uh, I, I am going to talk more about roosting, but uh, for roosting, these little birds that we want to use roost boxes, honestly, they're so hardy, they're not going to use them until like it's literally like they're going to freeze to death. They don't just use them for fun. But downy woodpeckers do. Uh, here's a red breast in that hatch. So the pair that has claimed it, they've been in and out. I think they, they made about 30 trips today. Um, I'm going to show you what the inside of that looks. But just in case you're not familiar with red breast in that hatches, here is one here. Okay, so this is what the inside of the box looks like. Again, I make my face disappear. Uh, inside, you can see that there is one red breast in that hatch in the box and the mate is poking their head in to say, do you like it? Do you love it? Can we raise our family here? And at the bottom, you can see some, uh, I believe in this one is pine shavings. I just get these at the like pet store. Um, it'll be like in the small mammal section, like for gerbil bedding, but some of that stuff synthetic. So you just want to make sure whatever you're buying is like just pine shavings or just aspen shavings. And it can never be sawdust because that'll get damp and uh, clawed up. So you definitely don't want to have sawdust, but if you put an inch or two of the shavings in the bottom, then they can go through their excavation ritual, which is a really important part of their nesting. So your box is going to be more attractive to them. Oh, here you go. It seems like I have to do a double. Okay, so last year I didn't have red breasted nut hatches for the first time. For the first time, I had black cap chickadees. And this was a very uh, quick, interesting story. Um, these eggs did not hatch. So Donnie and Marie, as they were named, uh, they had these eggs and it turned out that they were not fertilized. So one of the birds or both of them were not fertile. I had never even thought of this possibility of how a nest could be unsuccessful. It never crossed my mind. Um, so she kind of did everything weird right from the start. This might have been their first go. Uh, she incubated for 39 nights and 25 days. So she started incubating just at night and then 25 days, day and night. And then she finally realized it wasn't going to happen. These eggs should have a maximum really hatched by day 13 of incubation. So once that day passed, this is when I started to get suspicious. So we'll see if they come back because I have another box on the other side of the yard because birds don't like to live close together. Not like tree swallows or bluebirds or like barn swallows who like like or purple martins who like to have like party colony. These guys like their space and they're very aggressive and territorial when they have chosen their spot. This is what Donnie and Marie's look like. This is a different way to mount them. You might be wondering why they're so high. Well, we live in the city. We can't just put them on the fence post because then 
then the cats and the squirrels can easily get to them. Your other question is, is like, what is that weird round thing on the top? That is usually known on the internet as a magic halo or a sparrow spooker. Usually people use these around their feeders to deter house sparrows. But I have read that um, the house sparrows become desensitized to that quite quickly because their need for food and easy food is so strong. So I only use them at nesting season. So even though I kept these boxes over the winter for possible roosting, I only put the sparrow spookers on when it started to look like nesting activity was starting to happen when nest boxes were starting to get looked at. So roosting, this is kind of, this is one of the notifications I turned off because it was distracting because every day, I don't know if she's coming back, but this is Roberta Downey Jr. Roberta started nesting in a house we put up. I had read that Downey woodpeckers take very readily to roosting boxes, but don't use nest boxes for nesting, but they love to spend the winter. And sure enough, once it went up, she happily went inside, but there was no interest in it when the roosting box was set up like a roosting box with the hole on the bottom. And I am going to show you why. Here is Roberta tucking down for the night. She goes in her hole every night. She taps the corner, does a little bit of preening, and then she tucks in and goes to sleep. She wakes up several times during the night and she does more preening. And then that's what. I mean, she's adorable and we love her. And now this is kind of the crazy part. Um, just gonna go back to my list here. So I had to look at the number again. So Roberta has slept in the box 132 nights as of tonight. And um, there was a small break in there because I had read on the internet that you should change the shavings in a box periodically because there's gonna be some feathers and poo. So I went in and I took out the shavings and I put in fresh ones. She punished me for 17 days and did not come back. I never thought she was coming back. And then all of a sudden, 17 days later, she started using it again. And so I didn't do the math, but she hadn't been in there that long at that point. So since then, like it's been months that she's been back and going in every single night at basically the same time. And so uh, now that it's getting later, it's a little bit of a nail biter because one of these days I'm going to be waiting and she's she's not going to come. So uh, let me just skip ahead for this video. Sorry. Uh, another very common roosting bird is northern flicker. And so uh, <laughs> another mistake. Um, I realized that this was a good chance that the northern flickers would nest here. So I switched the box. And so I lost this roosting female northern flicker. Um, and I think she probably would have stayed for the winter. But since I've had the northern flicker specific box up in that same spot it's been checked out several times and so now i have it stuffed to the brim because that's what they like as part of their mating ritual they don't want um a little bit of uh pine shavings at the bottom they want the entire box full so that they can pull everything out and i just saw a little pop-up from tracy in the chat uh the difference for roosting and nesting is nothing and so in the stores they have some labeled as roosting and I just say that's that's not how it works because the holes on the bottom and even the northern flicker slept on the bottom. Could you imagine sleeping on the bottom with the hole there? They'd be so cold. I think the theory when these were made was that the heat was going to rise to the top and that they were going to like cling to the inside. They don't do that. So, and I only know this because I have a camera on them, right? So I would say that if you want to put up a roosting box, just use your nest box. That's it. Uh, Northern Flying Squirrels. That is another fun visitor I have in my yard who also enjoy roosting boxes. Um, they like to have little naps during the night and sometimes when it was really cold. Oh, it's so cute. There's a yawn. Uh, they would also spend the day, um, but then they did find like they they're nesting by now, like they probably have babies by now. Um, they didn't have them in mind, but then I realized I think that um, I have to uh, 
you know, like make more of a colony friendly box. And then, then they would decide that it's also a good nesting spot. So I'm going to do things a little differently, but our red squirrel took it over. I had red squirrels nesting once. I'm not doing that again. So uh, I took the box down and I'll try again in the fall. Oh, there we go. Okay. Now we're onto the water. I'm sorry, you guys, this is so much longer than I thought. Um, I hope you're not like dropping off like flies. I'm going to speed it up. I don't have a pond. I don't have a natural body, body of water. We're talking about bird baths. Number one, why is everything for birds so crappy? That is what I want to know. These birds are, these bird baths are too slippery, too deep, made of materials that cannot withstand our winter. But the big, big thing is slippery and too deep. Okay, so that's the number one thing. Bird baths have to be shallow. You have to be like a puddle in the forest. That's what they're looking for. They need to be grippy. The bird baths, they'll never go in, pull in a small bird into a glass bird bath. That's terrifying to them. They need to be easy to clean. They need to be at varying height. Some birds really like ground bath, some like hanging baths, and some like the pedestal bath. So you really have to kind of play around to see who you're getting and what they prefer. And the other thing is you can't just stick them out in the open. They need to be sheltered. The birds like to investigate things quite thoroughly before they'll use them. So if you're putting it out in the middle of somewhere, you're going to have a lot less visitors because that bird's going to have to be brave enough to cross the yard in open air to land on a bird bath completely exposed to predators to try your bird bath. So I'm going to show you uh, what I tried to do first. Okay, I tried this. This actually looks okay, right? But I'm going to tell you everything that was wrong with it. I didn't really get any birds here. So I've got this like Costco, like water fountain bubbler thing. Impossible to clean. Impossible to clean. No one can tell me they can get this clean because you can't even get all the water out at once. So you can't put bleach in it because you can't get all the bleach out. So this thing ended up disposed of. Uh, this is good up here. It's a very shallow hanging bath with a little water wiggler in it. And it has a wood surround, which is nice and gri grippy. And the dish that goes inside is very uh, gradual and very grippy and very shallow. Uh, that one's from Wild Birds Unlimited. And then I have this <laughs> pedestal bath. This is a big no. It's ceramic. It's super slippery. There was no gradual empty uh, entry and it was super deep. But the little tinkling fountain on top, I wish I still had because it was it made a lovely noise and birds are very attracted to the sound of water. So it's great to have a water wiggler where they can visually see the water moving. That's very attractive to them. But if you're trying to pull in birds from around you, they need to hear that water. So that was great for that. But eventually I broke it way down here. You can see I have a little dish that's a spare dish for this uh, hanging feeder that was really inexpensive. It was like $14. I just have it sitting on a plant pot and I have some pebbles in it. Um, that one got more visitors than anything. Now, here's the problem. The reason why, even though there were some visitors at that one that I barely got any, I don't know if you can see the date. This is 2018. This is the year before I spent the winter deciding how I was going to make it better. We've got playhouses here. This is where it's a heavy play area. Why would birds want to go here? I should have asked myself that. The path on the right over here is our direct entry to the backyard. Every time we went into the backyard, we walked past this spot. On the other side of it is the path to our garage. Every time we came home and left, we walked down this path. Why would birds want to go to this extremely high traffic, busy, loud area? Well, because I could see it from the window where this picture was taken from. But as soon as you start thinking that do it for birds first, not yourself, you'll get more birds. I'd like to say something like a commercial, like I guarantee it, but I can't. And you, I, I don't think you can hold me to that. This is my favorite bird bath of all time. And of all places, it's from Canadian Tire, who I'm super mad at because they don't have wheelchair friendly um, hallways right now. I did come the aisles. I did complain and I got blank looks. So I took that higher. Anyway, the top of this comes off. It screws off so you can use it on the pedestal. I take most of mine off and I put it on the ground. Uh, this is a closer look at the same dish, just a different color of the one that's in my um, 
hanging back. But now I've seen at Wild Birds Unlimited, they actually have like a, a much bigger one that sits in a little like ground level stand. So I thought that was pretty cool. I haven't tried it myself, but uh, it looks it looks like a good like if I needed another bird bath, I would try that for sure. This is what my bird bath looked like now. This is when I decided that I didn't have to see them use the bath to enjoy them having a bath. So this is a picture from last year. I have put the bird baths on the ground. Um, in this area, there's a total of four. Some of them have, uh, two of them have bubbler pumps and two of them don't. Some of the shyer birds who like to skulk in here do not like the pumps in the bath. They like a really shallow, quiet bath, but the sound of water brings them to this area and then they use the bath they prefer. On the other hand, some of the birds love the loud water and they literally stand at the um, exit for the water out of the pump and they have this like splash bath. So you kind of have to cater to some different needs, but you're going to have more birds come to your yard if they can hear water. Uh, who do I have here? Oh, okay. Let me show you a little example of a bird who is renowned for being skulky. We've got a fox sparrow here. And uh, I had my first fox, fox sparrow in 2020, and I was very excited. But last year, like I like I had them all the time. It was so crazy. Um, and definitely the reason that the fox sparrows wanted to come from my yard was the density that I had created because they love to hide. It's, I'm pretty happy though, the fox sparrows. I love them. What a fancy bird. Uh, I'm gonna go to next. Uh, okay, this is an example of a bird who, I don't know why the videos are different sizes. I'm sorry. So this is a smaller video, uh, a Western tanager. Um, they really liked the moving pump. And uh, you can see, I also have some flat rocks in there, not slippery ones, grippy ones, because some of the really tiny birds like ruby crowned kinglets like to stand on the rock. So they're not like all the way in the water. When you have, um, the these bird baths you can't tell from the picture are speckled on the bottom so the birds can actually look at the water and gauge the depth as if it was pebbles on the bottom if yours is just a solid color and you can't um, and they can't see that i would throw some rocks in the bottom and then they can tell how deep it is and that lets them know that it's safe or not and then they'll be more likely to go in uh, let's see, Northern Flying Squirrels, they love the hanging bath. Now, interestingly enough, um, the white-breasted nuthatches, the downy woodpeckers, and the northern flickers all exclusively use the hanging baths and trees until I made the ground level baths um, have a lot more wood. So I added all this driftwood around it and then they started coming. And then, you know, I should have put the video in here, but last year I had, um, I get brown creepers every year, but last year was the first time one had a bath. And first it was all over the driftwood and then went in for the bath. So I know that finally I made it to its liking. Uh, so you can get some pretty fancy visitors coming to your bird baths. Um, I would say that the fanciest warblers, the harder to see warblers, absolutely enjoy this bath. So they like to stand on that twig in the water. I'm going to play it again while I talk. They like to... Um, stand on the twig in the water. They like to stand on the rock. Sometimes they like to have the bath behind the rock to feel even more safe. But look how shallow my water is. That, that Canada warbler, who's so small, can fully stand up in there no problem. Um, so uh, I get Canada warblers every year. Um, and every year, the visit gets a little longer in the spring and the fall. So I must be doing something right because it's not about just getting a fleeting glimpse at a bird. It's that the first year I tried to do this, I only saw it once for a second. And then after that, now I'm having them stay for weeks. That's, you know, that's where I feel success and that's what um, motivates me to continue. Oh, what do I see a third time? Okay, so then another thing you can do is really moving water. I rigged up this pump and uh, the Rufus hummingbird I found was a little bit more uh, water loving than the ruby throated. But this little guy just absolutely loved sitting on this branch and letting the water fall on him. Um, and I had this idea 
because the downy woodpeckers uh, that we had in our yard last year, I don't know if it was Roberta and Robert, I'm not sure, um, but they would stick to the little, we named him uh, Burr Oak Obama. So the Burr Oak is quite small and they would each go on it. And when I had uh, the sprinkler out, um, like not for watering grass, just like the sprinkler attachment on the hose. And I literally planted a forest last year. So I was watering and it cost me a fortune, but at least they're established now, right? But they would wait on the tree until I gave them a shower with it. And so whenever I had it, they would go over there and wait for me to spray them. So I have a terrible cell phone video somewhere. But um, once I saw that, I was like, oh, birds like showers. That's cool. Good to know. Okay, winter bird baths. Controversial, but not really. Uh, they all recommend, all of our bird, big bird outfits recommend providing water for birds year round. Um, some of these places are not where we are, where the fall is like their winter. Um, so uh, I use heated bird baths. You definitely don't get as much traffic, but the rules don't change. And I find that this is where like some of the worst bird baths on the market are, are the winter heated ones. They're so deep. Um, you really don't need much. The birds mainly are just looking for a quick drink. When it is minus 35 polar vortex, there's no reason to have a bath out. The birds, they don't want it. Like there's no reason to waste the energy. Uh, but when it gets warm, and then we hit crazy winter temperatures that are like plus 10 degrees, I'll throw the pump out there for a short period of time that also has a, this one is like one of my regular baths, but it has a de-icer in it, which is also an option. Um, but the Bohemian wax wings, I was out one afternoon and I came back to mud brown empty baths and so many videos, I don't have no idea how many Bohemian wax wings had come through, but they soaked the camera so much that the sound didn't work anymore. Um, the videos are insane. Like you can't even see what's going on most of the time because the camera is so wet. But uh, the birds need to be clean in the winter. Clean feathers insulate better. Clean feathers fly better. There is a preening. why birds spend so much time preening. It's life or death for them. So they do when it's warmer like to have a bath okay the house sparrows it's minus 20 and they're going to be in the bath there's nothing you can do about that um there was a crazy story that like someone had birds like freeze to death in their bath and i looked everywhere there was never a picture of the bird bath there was never a picture of the birds and it's the only example in the entire internet of this happening yet everyone is using this as gospel and i find that bizarre because the only thing i can think of is that it was this crazy deep slippery bath and that they submerged when they shouldn't have um this is mainly what a winter bird bath for a little bird this is my heated bird bath i've had these for uh three years um this one's a farm innovators one um and uh so like the chickadees they'll like red breasted nuthatches at, like and downy woodpeckers will not bathe in the winter they'll have snow baths so they will not bathe in the winter but the chickadees will as soon as it gets a little warm and they're so happy and eager to be able to fix up their feathers which like i said life or death for them okay this is the slide that i was talking about before about keeping it clean uh this is from the cornell lab of orthonology their website all about birds which is a great website so um, when you're cleaning your feeder, um, and the reason it's bleach is because bleach kills salmonella. Vinegar and good wishes will not kill salmonella. So um, you have to wash it quite well, but you don't want to use too much bleach. So it's one part bleach and nine parts water. So I actually make that mixture in a spray bottle for my bird baths. And then so I empty the bird bath. I spray the bird bath very lightly because you don't need a lot. Then I scrub it with um, an old, uh, like just like one, you know, like a dish brush that you would use for dishes. I don't use it on my actual dishes after, don't worry. And wear gloves. I can't say that enough, wear gloves. Now you're working with bleach and now I've put it in a spray bottle. Now that we all have masks, wear a mask because I inhaled that once when I put it in a sink with hot water and my throat was scorched for about three days. So I have learned my lesson and I'm hoping you don't learn it the same way. So when you're putting it on the sink, you want to take all your bird feeders apart. You want to put it in, you want to scrub it, you want to put it out to dry. And when it's totally dry, you'll put it back up for the birds. Now, uh, this is of course, keeping in mind that you're still feeding the birds that are going to be passing on those diseases very easily. 
the easiest part is to let that finch family who loves to eat seeds to eat the native plants, right? Makes it easier. Uh, also, if you have like, um, you don't have to have a zillion bird feeders out. If you have like two of the same one, like two of those little seed balls like I do, you can put one out while the other one is being washed so that you don't have to wait for it to dry to put it back out. So you kind of just cycle through. It's, uh, it, it makes it easier for me and they're not expensive. Um, so I've told you that you're supposed to like hide all the water. So how are you supposed to see the birds coming if you've hidden everything that they're attracted to? I know that doesn't make sense, but it's because you have perches and that is what birds do, they perch. And so if you have lots of perches in really great viewing spots, you're going to see these birds come to your yard. Um, I'm gonna show you some of my perches that I have. So I use like sticks that I find, um, some driftwood pieces. I have obelisks uh, that I grow the vines on like scarlet runner bean. Um, you can just stick uh, like a stick, like if you have a flower pot on your deck, you can just stick a twig that's kind of coming out of that. Birds will perch on it. It's really, it's quite phenomenal. But if you're a photographer, uh, it's a great way to get photos and you can get creative. You can use like a rock, you can use use different twigs and cycle them out. And I'm going to show you some of the, actually a ton of the pictures we've already looked at are birds using the perches. It's just most of the perches is cropped out. So here's a Western tanager on a piece of driftwood. Um, this particular piece, I have many species on. And so I put this sticking um, into the ground. I, I drove a stake into the ground and then I drilled the driftwood to the stake to keep it really steady. Um, and then I put this near the bird baths, kind of near the shrubs that are coming out of it. So it's a nice solid chunk for them to land on while they thought about the idea of heading down to the bird baths. So this perch was extremely popular. A uh, perch that was very close to it also then um, is a very attractive one for warblers. So basically I have perches that are for um, like where I sit, uh, the light is best for like the morning until like very early afternoon. And then after that, I'd be uh, shooting directly into the sun. So then I have to move to the other yard if I can only go out in the evening. So then I have perches that I can see from that direction as well. And it's just like the best, easiest photo ops because I mean, how hard is it to get a shot of Wilson warblers when they're so fast and darting in and out of the foliage trying to get bugs? Um, it's really hard to get a clear picture of them. Sometimes just the things you're growing can be its own photo prop. Uh, photo prop. So this is a pine siskin. This is on uh, one of the scarlet runner beans. So after my flowers have faded, uh, the beans grow and then I dry those over the winter and I use those to plant the next year. These beans are gigantic. They're out of a fairy tale and uh, they're an amazing little photo prop. Um, you know, the pine siskins and chickadees, I had quite a few shots on, but this was my favorite one of the pine siskins. Okay, you have this amazing habitat. Who's gonna wreck it? It could be us by putting bird feeders in baths if we're not gonna take care of them. We're a risk to our own habitat. Uh, invasive species, but why not natural predators? windows and cats. Okay, so according to the Canadian Wildlife Federation, 100 to 350 million birds are killed by cats each year. Can you even think about how many birds that is in one spot? Like, it's insane. And the biggest effect of birds, uh, sorry, cats on birds that are killing is very close to home. So if you're trying to create a wildlife habitat, you cannot have a cat that goes outside. Unless, it goes into something like a catio or is on like a little like a uh, leash and collar. And uh, I, well, my cat made an appearance earlier. He was a stray. We got him when he was eight and now he's 16 and he's an indoor cat and he loves his catio. And I'm going to show you a picture. So um, I have to keep your cats indoors, especially at night. Why especially at night? Not all birds sleep in trees. Birds sleep on the ground. Birds sleep low down in, in shrubs. They are asleep. They're so vulnerable and cats aren't necessarily, I mean, most cats are just house cats. They're well-fed. 
They're just killing to play. They're a domestic animal and the bylaw says to keep them inside. Um, you know, I think people would freak out if I let my dog just run around on their lawn. Um, so it's a really difficult situation. And I know it's not one that's easily broached with neighbors for sure. It's a very difficult thing. Um, this is the first catio we did, but uh, he had lots of room to move around and he had like a cushion. This is just bare bones, but he had like a chair in it with a cushion on it. And then he had another cushion up here and uh, it was in a different spot. I just pulled it out for a uh, photo. Um, um, but what we found that since he was already getting close to a senior cat, when this came out, um, as otherwise he just stayed inside, um, he didn't need that space. He just wanted his little heated blanket. I know we have a heated blanket for him and his little donut bed. And we put it just inside this crate. And he was so much happier. He was just in and out. Um, you know, what we realized one of his legs was kind of bu uh, bugging him. So jumping up and down was kind of an issue for him to have to do over and over again. Um, but if you uh, have a younger cat, you might need more space for them to be able to like play and run around. But if your cat's older, this maybe is all they need. And like he loves it. Like I can't even explain to you how much you love it. If you're like have never been in the situation, you're looking at it, you're like, that's cruel. Like it's his favorite thing ever, especially the heated blanket part. Okay, windows. It's not that they can't see the windows. It's that they don't know their windows. They think it's just more wonderful wildlife habitat to investigate. And especially when they're new windows, um, they have lots of like coatings in them to make them more energy efficient. That also equals more reflective. So currently I'm actually about to switch this out. I'm just waiting for it to be above 10 degrees for overnight. Um, I have the decals that you like stick around, but what that's actually shown is that's not really good enough. So um, I'm switching to the strips that have little dots and you put those up the window at uh, the full length um, because we have, now, now here's the thing, I don't really get window strikes. Um, just the way that my window is situated, it doesn't hit the reflection like a lot of windows would. So I have those decals up. I mean, I remember in the last 10 years, like two or three window strikes in that whole time and not at all since we put those up, but I do wanna make it better. I'm always trying to make it better. So we're gonna take those down this year and put up the strips two inches apart because the decals, it's hard to get them that close. So you might need to have so many that it becomes very expensive. The strips are actually quite economical. I ordered mine through a fundraiser for Alberta Wildlife um, out of Calgary on their website. So they have a shop and you can get, oh, I have it ready because I was reading about it. You can get window collision tape. So this is what I'm putting up as soon as it gets a bit warmer. Um, there are some windows where you may never have had a strike because of the way that they're situated. Those are not the ones that you're gonna concentrate on. Any window that you've had a strike, that is where you're gonna start for sure. And every little bit makes a difference. Okay, house sparrows, starlings. If you're a little bit more suburban or rural, you're gonna be battling starlings as well. House sparrows are an invasive species. They're actually a European type finch. They were brought over and it exploded. Why is it a problem? They're also cavity nesters. So they are bigger and more aggressive than most of our cavity nesting birds. So they will take the cavity before our native birds can use it. If our native birds can't have successful nests, then their population decreases. So what's gonna happen eventually if we continue to feed and breed house sparrows, all of our native birds are gonna get pushed out of the city and only go where house sparrows aren't. House sparrows need people. So if you have house sparrows, it's because of you. I have some house sparrows, it's because of me. It's because I live in the city. You're never going to have zero. It's not an attainable goal. But if you don't feed them and you don't house them, they will look somewhere else. So you have to check things like eaves troughs. If you can't get them covered, um, just make sure you're cleaning them out. Um, starlings, house sparrows, magpies are not covered uh, by the Migratory, Migratory Bird Act. So you can remove their nests. So that's why I have the sparrow spookers on those boxes. And the sparrow spookers can squeeze in very uncomfortably to a one and a quarter hole. That is absolutely um, I guess besides the point, because if you have a one and an eighth inch hole up for a red breasted nuthatch house wren or chickadee, the house sparrow can still stick their face in enough. And I've seen it happen. And they pull out the nestling before it's ready to fledge and they take it. And I've actually seen that. 
So I learned my lesson the hard way and that was a one and a quarter inch hole. So I only do the one and the eighth and I only do it with the sparrow spookers. And since then, I have not had a house sparrow attack on a house. Um, it works, but you can't abuse it. You can't use it extra. You can't use it after their um, nesting season because then the young house sparrows will be completely desensitized to it. They won't care. So you have to be very careful when you use the deterrent so that you maximize the effectiveness. Um, for starlings, if you have starlings, you probably just shouldn't put up uh, like um, a northern flicker or saw wet box. Um, I think they can get in a one and a half. So if you just have the starlings, if your target is the um, a one and an eighth inch hole, you should be fine. Uh, plants. The reason that invasive plants are a problem is because they choke out our neighbor, native plants. And what you want to do is pull those up. The best example I can think of in the city is creeping bellflower um, is probably one that we see everywhere. And I still have to pull that up every year and have been uh, eight years, maybe. And still it persists. I'll probably be pulling it up forever. It's extremely hard to get rid of, but by pulling it up, at least I'm giving uh, the other chance of room to grow. So you have to keep at it. And so be careful what you plant because just because it's not actually labeled as invasive doesn't mean it's not gonna overtake your garden. So when I talked about that Virginia creeper, like it's a lifelong commitment, that spot is surrounded by concrete and not near a house structure. So you have to be careful where you put that or it will spread like wildfire. Okay, we're getting close to the very, very end. Here are some fancy visitors. I get northern flying squirrels for the last three years. I adore them. They're adorable. Um, a big surprise last year was a short-tailed weasel. He came for the bird baths. He loved it. The northern hawk owl two years ago was uh, like I nearly died in my shoes. Um, this picture was actually taken down the street because the one that was um, it, like for me uh, was terrible. So uh, I'm showing you the, the better picture. I, I guess I'm allowed to do that. Northern ghost hawk in January. Oh, I think there's a magpie in this picture. Oh, no, there's not. I guess I had a magpie in it for, for, for fun. But um, the barred owl was amazing. Nashville warbler isn't supposed to be in range for us. I get them every year. They love water and they love bugs. The great cheek thrush um, was a two week visitor bulking up for migration. They make almost a direct flight in the spring from Columbia to Canada, which is insane. Um, and so it feasted on my neighbor's um, Mount Nash berries until it was almost too fat to fly. Cape May Warbler, I hadn't had one in five years, but I had several this year and they really stuck around eating a ton of bugs and enjoying the bird baths. I'm hoping for more this year. Oven birds, I had like a life science. I, I've always had oven birds briefly. They were everywhere this year. It was absolutely insane. And they were so friendly. I was like, are you even an oven bird or are you another bird like a chickadee in disguise? Uh, here's one I didn't get a photo of. I saw its yellow butt and it was a McGilvery's warbler, which is absolutely not in range for Edmonton. And I, uh, I'm at least glad I got a video, but I'm really hoping that it comes back next year so I can get a photo. And go to the next one, gray catbirds. The reason I get them is because the density of the shrubs, they're notoriously skulky birds, but this year I didn't get one. Um, so maybe next year, you never know. Brown creepers, I'm expecting one any day. I should have had one at the beginning of March, but on my calendar where I record bird sightings, um, I see that in the next couple of days, I, I saw another one last year. So I've been keeping my eyes peeled because um, last week the weather wasn't so great. So I wasn't surprised that I didn't see one. Um, and like I said, last year was the first year it used my bird bath. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had chestnut sided warbler, uh, which was really phenomenal. And um, because uh, I spent time at, at East, my I'm, well, I was born in Quebec and my family, uh, some of it still lives there. Uh, so I wasn't there too long ago and I had seen a bunch of chestnut side warblers and that's the only reason I knew what it was. So I'm speaking at record speed now, sum it up, plant native plants. You won't regret it. It'll save you money and it will save you work and you'll get more birds. Always think of your habitat first and yourself last.
but I'm pretty sure you can find a way to make it great for both of you. If you're buying something for birds, if you can't clean it, don't buy it. Everything you put out for birds must be squeaky clean. Food, water, nest boxes. It has to be clean because you're introducing a foreign object into your wildlife habitat. Cater to the native. Don't spend your time on house finches and house sparrows. There are more amazing native birds waiting to come to your yard. They're not going to come if you have a giant gang of house sparrows and house finches the uh, skulky warblers, the hummingbirds, they won't come to your yard. It's too intimidating. So make it a spot that's peaceful and a clamoring uh, tray feeder full of birds is gonna prevent you from getting more birds. That's it. So uh, thank you so much. I'm pretty sure we're gonna do questions now. I don't know how that's working exactly, but uh, Brian, you can jump in anytime here. Well, I, I, you may have noticed I disappeared momentarily. Apparently my Zoom crashed. Uh, oh. So I got back in. You missed but, the most important part. Yeah, I know, but I, I, may, I was fortunately making notes along the way. I'm just kidding. So of the questions, most oh. of them have been answered. Oh, okay. So I'll start with the more recent ones. Um, so um, the spookers. Yes. You, do you use those on the flickers or the flying squirrel nest boxes? No, um, no, that's an excellent question. Um, so I put them on the bird boxes for the birds who would lose a fight to a house sparrow. Um, right. The northern flickers can take care of it. And the benefit, so like if you haven't had northern flickers in your yard yet, you're not going to put up a box yet um, because you're just going to be battling house sparrows. So wait until you see that species present. Um, but with that big hole for the northern flickers, um, how I'm preventing house sparrows while I'm waiting for flickers is it's stuffed to the brim with sawdust. And then they take some of it out and try and get in. And I go back up on the ladder and I stuff it again. So I don't use the sparrow spookers on those because the northern flickers <laughs> and the solid owl can definitely handle it. Um, the, the way that the box is for the northern flying squirrels, it was against a tree with a side mounted hole. And so that wasn't particularly attractive to them because it was very dense in a spruce. Right. So uh, uh, Benita had a couple of questions. One was where you get driftwood. <laughs> just out oh, the river yeah. or you know what i bought actually i bought it at um kiwi nursery and then i bought some at burn co and um oh. you know like there's been some places that it just like i just kind of surprised to see it but yeah definitely be careful where you get it from because you're not allowed to take it from it from everywhere um but there the guy um that was supplying it to kiwi was getting it from bc and now that the travel restrictions is eased i'm hoping that they stock that up again Okay. And um, do you do anything for bats? Oh, yes. I love bats. So last year, um, so <laughs> <laughs> bats are super exciting for me and bats eat, uh, bats eat a ton of insects and they also love to eat moths. So last year I got really into moths and I was putting up a moth light and uh, that was when I saw my first yard bat. So I have a bat, sorry, what? Oh no, that's it for the yeah, uh, nice. yeah. So I have a bat box up, and uh, I'm just uh, I'm hoping this year I will get a bat in it. <laughs> Last year I I was looked up and, and I saw something in it and I got so excited so I ran and got my camera and I pointed it up there and like ISO nine million to try and see what was up there in the dark and it was a leaf. It was so, so disappointing, but I'm hoping this year, now that I've actually seen a bat for the first time, I know that they're present. So yeah, that, so that's another reason why um, you want moths in your yard, because bats love them. And so do northern flying squirrels. They love to eat bat, um, moths. So this one is, was early on. Do you, do you, can you share your suet recipe? Do you make it yourself or do you buy uh, it? No, I buy my suet just because uh -huh. um, there are some things to consider when you're doing like homemade for birds. And yes. so it's rendered uh, beef suet, uh, beef lard or whatever. Um, not all fat is good for birds. And so when I'm buying it, I know that it's gone through the rigorous practice of making it. So I don't want to do something um, and also, um, 
the suet feeders, because you're only feeding the birds that are going to eat it, you don't go through as much. Um, what I would say is there are different types of suet on the market. So I was buying one that was the nutty blend from Wild Birds Unlimited, and um, the birds loved it, but so did the house sparrows and the magpies were a bit interested in it, too interested. It was very annoying. Um, so I actually tried switching just to the straight beef suet. And the you know downy woodpeckers begrudgingly ate it. So did the nut hatches. But then I realized in the nutty blend, there's actually corn and oats, which was what the house sparrows were really attracted to. So I just switched to the one that was just the nuts and bugs. And I haven't had any, like the house sparrows can't really access it. They haven't been interested at all. And so at this point, I actually only have a little bit of suet up. My seed has gone away. I have full out gone to nesting season. I do not want extra birds in my yard who are just going to stress out the nesting birds. Okay. And the last one that I had, others were asked and answered along the way by someone else or whatever. But the, there was one at the very, very beginning about in your front area where the rocks now go right oh, up to the base of the tree? Yeah, so um, yeah, spruce are definitely really difficult to plant under or near. Um, so because they suck up so much moisture. So I've definitely had to experiment a lot with what I can grow under there. So for right underneath the tree, I put the rocks because um, things get trapped inside and the birds love to dig in those little crevices to get bugs and bugs will overwinter in there. So I have that underneath the spruce. And then when you get outside of the drip line, the rock actually has big, like it's hard to see from the pictures, but like has big cutouts and then there's plants going in those. So I've tried a whole bunch of shrubs um, along that, uh, like that's closer. And as I get farther from the spruces, I can plant things that require um, more moisture. So what I have right now that's really working for me is I had, um, you know what? I hope Mana, Mana, are you still there? Because uh, she's going to be able to put the proper name into the chat. I was growing um, the silver leaf, uh, flat leaf Artemisia, which is um, not like the mound, but like it's a trailing one. There's a native version. So I've had success with that right under the drip line of the spruce and not needing to water it. But now I've learned there's a native version. So I've just started adding that. So I've got one fair size plot. I think I bought uh, three plants from Nana. Um, but Nana, if you're still there, please um, put the uh, proper name of that uh, Artemisia family. Oh, she's muted. So she's trying to say something. I, Nana, you should be able to unmute. There you go. Okay, so um, you asked about Artemisia species? Yeah, what the proper name was, I couldn't remember. It, it, it is named Prairie Sagewort. Prairie Artem Sagewort. Artemisia, so, Artemisia yeah. Ludiviciana. There you go. I'm going to remember better prairie sagewort. <laughs> That's how my brain rolls. But yeah, I've had a lot of luck with that family of plants very close to the spruce without having to add any additional water. Yeah, it has many other common names though. Oh, oh whoops. silver sage, white sage. <laughs> Lots of them. Thank you, Mana. You're welcome. Um, Brian, was there any other questions down in the chat? No, that's all the ones I had. Um, and I've it's been a I know we you you think it was long, which is it was for our our stuff because we've been getting <laughs> used to shorter ones, but this was really good. There's a lot of neat stuff um that uh, you, you don't actually think about so this is really good well i'm glad you thought so i just saw a question put up mana is the owner of arnica wildflowers and i get lots of my native plants from her my pleasure so i, I think we should it's always sad on on zoom that we can't uh, uh, even if we all shouted it that we only hear one <laughs> but um I want to thank you. This has been really great, and uh, people can try clapping hands or thumbs <laughs> up and stuff like yeah, that. You, I, you know, honestly, anyway, so. I'm just so happy that there is people interested. And you know, I'm not like a. I, I actually kind of I hate social media, but I feel like it's a it's the only tool I have to get like 
information to people about what I'm doing, because yeah. like I said, I'm learning every day. And uh, once it hits summertime, it really turns into just like a stream of bird bath videos. But soon <laughs> we're going to have nesting birds. And uh, I think it's going to be really cool. But um, yeah, as soon as I learn something new or try something new, I'm always putting it in there. So uh, yeah, if you have Instagram, go for it. Um, but I get it. I, I really don't like social media. So um, I understand if you don't. Oh, there was just a quick question about which part of the city you live in. Oh, I'm pretty close to uh, West Mount Mall. So I'm closer to, uh, here's a good landmark for Edmonton, Sherbrooke Liquor Store. <laughs> Everyone knows where Sherbrooke Liquor Store is. <laughs> okay, well. Yeah, so well. I live like minutes from like when people go birding to the grain terminal, I could drive there in probably three minutes. So everyone kind of from Edmonton would know that I'd be crossing the Yellowhead. So I am minutes from like, what is it? A freeway, a highway. I am on a bus route. Um, I have a lot of traffic <laughs> in my yard, yet still they come. So um, I really hope you guys try. The birds take a little bit of time to find you. But as soon as you start making changes, you notice an immediate difference. And then the more you build on that, the more you're going to see. And uh, I guarantee it's so enjoyable. Citizen science is a real thing. So having those observations of things you're seeing and adding them to things like eBird and iNaturalist are integral for the scientists who aren't in all of our yards or seeing what it's like in every city. Um, we can do that for them. Right. Okay. So the, I just uh, the, I have one announcement uh, about next week on March 24th. Um, there's a bird studies presentation on bird tracks. So if anybody's interested in that, they can register for that. So I'll stop the recording or if I can let me. There we go. Um, yeah.